Leslie Feist, welcome to E-Town. Thank you so much. It's funny, we talked about this um, more than 10 years ago backstage at Telluride. That's right. That's about, right. Um, about you coming to E-Town. Here you are. Very exciting. We planted the seed. I know. <laughs> good things sometimes take time. Uh, how was last... Most good things start in catering at a festival, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many relationships... Actually, I met Helen backstage at Telluride. Well, there you go. Yeah, it works exactly. out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> What festival was that? At Telluride. Really? Same one, yeah. Oh, man. Not the same year. <laughs> um, no, it's so, uh, it's so cool. How was playing Red Rocks with your fellow Canadian Sarah McLaughlin last night? How was uh, that? It's, it was stunning. Yeah. It's just so stunning. I don't know what the audience is looking at, because all I was looking at was it's these incredible. two yeah. flanking, massive pieces of gorgeous ancient rock and then the perfect blue sky with a setting sun. I mean, it was, yeah, it was hard to concentrate actually. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, well, you've been at this a while. I was just trying to think about your life early on in Calgary, singing mm. in choir, yeah. um, singing in punk bands. Those are not always, don't always go hand in hand. In fact, your no. voice is so lovely. I kind of have a hard time imagining, but I know you could pull it off. I know you rocked it, but I've just, the punk phase must've been um, teenage angst. I think it's just that when you're that, when, well, in my case, I didn't really have any musical education. I mean, choir is a great place to hide out, sort of. Right. You know, so in a way, you're not really listening to the quality of your voice. You're learning about melody. You're learning about harmony. Yeah. You're learning how to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And actually, it's a great place to learn to sing loud. Yeah. Because no one's really going to hear you. Right. So I felt volume. I felt yeah. what it was to be inside a big sound. It's a powerful thing to sing in community, to sing with a bunch of people. Absolutely. I mean, I do Primal. shape note singing now. Yeah. I found my way back to choir, but through yeah. shape note singing. And, um, and should we tell people what shape note singing is? Because it's ultimately, it's sort of an Appalachian tradition, right? Quaker. I wish I knew more about the history of yeah. it. I just know that when I'm sitting in that square, it's, a, it's well, okay, the basics are that, well, the first rule I learned was if you're there, you're singing. So there's no performing it for anybody. You're the, if you're there, you're in part of the community yeah. and you're singing. And also the woman next to me said, the only other rule is if, if you think the person next to you is singing a wrong note, then just sing louder. <laughs> I mean, wow. Basically what she's saying is yeah. there's no wrong notes. Beautiful. And so it's almost like that Ennio Morricone, the mission soundtrack yeah. where there's this choir of just, you know, like yeah. a wild, beautiful yeah. choir. And, or the um, Bulgarian women's choir where you think they're oh. singing wrong notes, but they're actually incredibly genius. They're yeah. the right notes they're to the make right. the hair stand up yeah, on your exactly, arms. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So you were singing choir. Then you went into punk music, punk rock music. Um, did you have outfits when you were in the choir? Yes. Yeah, okay. I had to wear a cummerbund. Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. Just in case anybody got pregnant. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I don't know what that was for. It was for. a Catholic school, so it would yeah. follow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have... Um, and I understand that when you started singing punk music, you hurt your voice a little bit. You strained your voice. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, Take in a, a way, yeah. Punk was the... Was the or I guess if we should say hardcore, it wasn't really punk because it was the 90s. So yeah. let's be real. Right. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you opened the, for the Ramones at some point. We opened for the Ramones. Our first show ever. Yeah. We won a high school battle of the bands and that. And the prize was to play at a festival, a real festival. Yeah. And it just so happened we were right before the Ramones. Yeah. That was crazy. Yeah. They helicoptered the in. Yeah. <laughs> and then immediately we're like, we're out of yeah. here. It was Calgary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, in a way, it was the birth of my interest in, in quiet and vulnerability and yeah. melody. And I learned to play guitar because I lost my voice screaming, basically. So I sort of convalesced yeah. by um, my, this doctor told me to swim laps so that I would, I would maybe get more breath support. Right. But what I ended up doing was I, I was thinking, I need to just find a way to not need so much breath support, not want so much. I didn't want so much volume. I wanted everything that happens in close proximity. Yeah. I didn't want to be yelling to the back of the room anymore. I have a um, probably unrealistic fantasy concept of the Toronto music scene of the mid-90s when you arrived there at the age of 20 or whatever you were, um, that it was uh, inclusive but also competitive in a good way and that people were wanting to sort of raise their game and that it was 
uh, supportive and kind of international and a little bit experimental and um, were you, you know, there? No, <laughs> I'm just making it up. I've never even been to Toronto. You in my were life. very much there. That was you couldn't. I could not have encapsulated it as well as that. That is exactly what it was. It was remarkable. Oh, good. So and, yeah. it, and it raised your game. You had to. You had to. You had to meet the level of talent that was around you, but it was also welcoming, right? Well, I guess I just, I kind of situated myself as the little sister in a lot of bands. Right. Everybody, every band wanted you to join the band. Well, I got to be a bass player in one band and just, you know, figure out how to hold down a root. And then I got to be the rhythm guitar player in another band by just saying, yeah, I play guitar. Yeah. And then I just got to watch this guy's this incredible guitar player named Jose Contreras' fingers for about three yeah. years. Well, and luckily it was all drop D, so it was just a lot of patterns. Yeah. But ultimately, my learning curve was vertical in those yeah. years, for sure. I have ceased to learn since then. But. I don't think that's... Uh, <laughs> I doubt that. We'll talk more about that in a little while. Um, but I do think the sort of international flavor of Toronto uh, is special about that city mm -hmm. from, again, my fantasy, uh, ignorant knowledge of not ever being there. Um, but I do feel like there were people you were playing music with who would go to Europe and then they'd come back or, or mm -hmm. musicians from other countries would. And of course, you know, being in Canada, there's a lot of French speakers and you're by. And so I know you moved to Paris at one point after you had had some success. And was that because you were spending a lot of time in Europe or you just wanted to change or what was that about? Well, I guess. I guess I did do a lot of touring from Canada. You would just head south because the cities between the cities in Canada are nine yeah. hours apart on average, but you just go south like a couple of hours, and all of a sudden they're about an hour apart. It was just sort of an economy thing. It was a, yeah. an economy of you know just you can get to more towns and yeah. play in front of less more towns with le with no one there is what I mean. <laughs> just those early years of touring, you know, yeah. just being glad if eight people showed up kind of thing. But a lot of I did a lot of that touring down the east. Eastern, yeah. Eastern states. Um, I can remember we would drive for no reason from Toronto all the way to, uh, well, outside DC, there was a club. Oh man. The Birchmere? No. no. Oh, I, I, someone yeah. knows, someone who's listening The knows. 930 Club. No, that's right in DC. It was, oh, oh, I, it had an O at the end of it. Anyway, we obviously. We are losing interest, <laughs> Leslie. <laughs> It's in, not uh, important. It was in a suburb Let's of DC. Let's move on. But they were the only person. Iotas. Nobody's ever heard of Iotas. That's right. But no. we would drive from Toronto no. No. all the way there. No, come on. To play to 30 people. Yeah. And anyway, so the we, point we, being. We all did that. Mm -hmm. every, mus every musician drove right. a lot and played to nobody That's right. for a while. That's right. Yeah. Everybody. But then some friends of mine, they somehow found their way to Europe. And so I just caught their slipstream eventually yeah. and went across the ocean. Gonzalez. Yeah. Chili Gonzalez was a good friend of mine. Yeah. He was at that point a beat maker yeah. and rapper. Yeah. And, and um, what did you find in Paris compared to what you had in Toronto? in terms of a music scene? Well, I, I guess I was never really in the music scene there. Yeah. Like chanson is dependent upon lyrics and many of them. And I didn't speak French. So I, 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 don't, I, I joked that it was the only place in the world where a scrappy Canadian could somehow become slightly exotic because it was, it was like, ooh, she's from elsewhere. And it was <laughs> Calgary. But it, and I was in Paris, but yeah. it just somehow, yeah. it, it, it somehow worked. It was, it was a lot of luck. It was... Um, yeah, it was just a strange time where I was the sidekick kind of for my friend. I, I jokingly said I was like his Vanna White. It wasn't really a musical role so much. I, was light, I would light his exploding cigar and stuff. It was kind of like electro vaudeville or something. We had matching outfits, you know what I mean? It was just sort of a show. Is there video? Um, yeah, there's, there's video <laughs> to be okay. found. All right, we'll find it. We're utterly charming because we're in our 20s, so, yeah. you know, it worked. Um, you know, I love the fact that this seems so sort of uh, happenstance, but there is an arc, there is, a, there is a sort of a logic to your creative pathway that really was focused on your songwriting and your production values and your interest in producing things that were artful and that people latched on. And along the way, let's not forget, you got to be really popular and you sold a lot of records. And um, you had videos on MTV and did all the things, right? And, um, and I, I think that that's brings us to this current moment where you've just made a very different kind of record mm. based on a different time of life. And um, I know that uh, this was a, 
the pandemic affected all of us in different ways. And for you, it was kind of a rare opportunity in a way too, to sort of stop that forward momentum, that, that um, commercial uh, push towards the next thing. Yeah, well, I guess I'd, I've been lucky that I've, I, because I signed a record deal in France and I was one of the only Anglo people on the label, they, they really left me alone. And for 20 years being on, signed to Universal, I, I, I basically never had any feeling of, you hurry up, we need something. There's, yeah. I, think, I don't think anyone was assuming they were going to make any money off me because it, was, it wasn't really that kind of thing. Yeah. I was just sort of, I, I snuck in somehow. I just snuck in and I got supported for 20 years by a major label, which most people would have a contrary story to that. And so I Hold was... Just a sec. Yeah. I'm going to make this go a little taller so you Wait, don't have to... Oh God, you're, she's getting <laughs> incredible shrinking guests. Okay. <laughs> I'm already short enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> anyway, so I, I, I had never really felt a rush to make records or anything like that. And I, I, I took a little bit too long probably each time between records. But it's because, like you know, you I would tour for three years or something and rest for a few months or a year, and then maybe you start to make another record. So it looked like six years between records, but it, that was an, an illusion. Yeah. So this one was actually, I think maybe even a little quicker. And there was something strange is that once my daughter was born, I had a different impetus to write. And I was the most prolific, prolific I've ever been in my life in the six months yeah. f before and after her birth. That's what I was alluding yeah. to when you said, I'm not learning anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> You're learning a bunch of new stuff. That's Compliments true. of your daughter. Who That's right. Who showed up four years ago. Yeah, she, she definitely, her existence, she, and my, my friend Ariel, who makes beautiful records as La Force, she's one of my dearest friends and a singer that I laud, and um, she had a daughter before me, and I watched it happen with her as well, where she just felt this extra, okay, wait a second, there's... there's there's someone coming up behind me and I'm going some, I'm going over this way and I have to make use of this time. Yeah. And, and, well, you have and, less time. And you have much less time. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I have a photograph of my youngest daughter when she was about two um, and my grandfather when he was about 98. And um, <laughs> They're together. They're together. And my grandfather's walking towards this, in through this meadow towards the sunset and I called and my daughter turned around so she's facing the camera mm. as my grandfather's walking to the horizon and it spoke to this passing of generations That's beautiful. which you just experienced yeah the arrival of your daughter and the passing of your dad that's right. It's it's a it's an impossible crossroads to find yourself in in, in joy and grief at the same time, um, and both of them are are have not previously been felt the scale of feeling. I really did feel like I was in a crucible for a couple of years there. It was an un, sort of an unthinkable uh, paradox to hold, to open my heart completely to this new little person while my heart was trying its hardest to close against the pain of yeah. such an impossible loss. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the fundamentals of life and love. And if you feel that's going to happen to you. Yeah. All of a sudden it's going to happen to you that you're going to be the person who's going to die. Yeah. That's what also becomes yeah. quickly apparent. I think it, well, pun intended. Is it okay to make a pun while talking about sure. death? Yeah. <laughs> Parenting you become death. a parent yeah. and then it's very apparent. Yeah. What's going to happen next yeah. to you? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> you feel it for the love of the other people, but and then all yeah. of a sudden your mortality becomes very, very visible. Yeah. Well, um, on that note. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> We're not going to change the subject right now. I am going to say this. In case you've just tuned in, you're listening to E-Town, and I'm here with Feist. Um, your song, Red Wing, mm. alludes to California winters. That's right. <laughs> and um, which you now experience because you're, you're living in L.A. So you could get you're, you're away from the northern Ontario <laughs> January weather. That's, that's right. Is that did you land yeah. in a community for you and your daughter that you feel connected to now? And you've got some people. It's so strange how many it's sort of like a zeitgeist. The neighborhood I live in, everyone that I know seems to live there, too. But none of us planned it. Let's all OK, give you 11 years and we'll meet on this particular street corner. But it keeps happening. That's and so there's old friends, new friends. There's, yeah. of course, you get a whole new community of people when you have a child, because all of a sudden the people who are in the same that same inexplicable to people who don't have kids, that yeah. kind of 
that thing you're carrying yeah. all of a sudden. Um, it's like um, it's like having a dog. <laughs> But who walks around on two legs? What's the... <laughs> no, I mean that um, when you walk around with your dog, everybody talks to you. That's right. And when you have a four-year-old, every other four-year-old or three-year-old or six-year-old is going to connect. Yeah, they see each I'm other. I'm not equating your child with a dog, well, just so you know. I do say that the, the, the dogs I had before prepped me for this level of love. Yeah. Geriatric dog is yeah. kind of parallel to tiny infant. Yeah. In that you have a lot to take care of. Yeah. It's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the last thing I want to just mention is that this world that you came up in of making music and recording and um, having a career and having commerce be a part of it and sustaining yourself that way, everything's changed, right? That everything has changed to the point where um, the fundamentals are still there. You write songs, you record them, mm -hmm. you tour, you travel, you play shows, but nobody buys records. And so the... the um, How'd they manage that, right? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's sort of like your dad was a painter, and so if, like, he just had to buy his canvases and all yeah. his supplies and made paintings and then just gave them all away. Pretty much. Yeah. Or you only get to sell them once. Yeah. Yeah, you never see them again. Right. It's not like a record where 20 years later someone could discover it fresh. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you seem to be on a really good creative path and things seem to be... This, this blending of your life transitions and your new role as a mom and your creativity and your new location seems to be going okay. Oh, well, thank from you. From a distance. Thank you. It yeah. feels okay from yeah. the inside, too. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad it was possible for you to take a break in the middle of this tour and stop oh, here and was a, come to Oh, this was fantastic. Yeah. It was a gift to get to come here finally. Well, we have more music to get to. So help me please welcome back to the stage at E-Town, Feist. <laughs> 